Hello and welcome to episode 378 of the Crate and Crowbar, a PC gaming podcast. My name is Chris Thurston and tonight I'm joined by Tom Senior. Hello there. Hello. Tonight I should say the 19th of August 2021. Beautiful balmy evening for Indeed. PC gaming intrigue. <laughs> I can feel it on the air. It's, it's there. Mm, what's that? I think actually that they've just been... Um, manuring the fields at the top of town Tom. Oh, that's, that's what that is it's not pc gaming intrigue it's shit it's just piles of shit anyway uh before we get to all that uh, i did want to a quick note um briefly talk about the podcast itself if i might get meta early um so i appreciate that lately our schedule on the crate and crowbar or our keeping to it ifness has been a little off, shall we say. We've had more episodes going up over the weekends. We've had um, more skip weeks than usual. Um, all of that as we sort of find our feet in a new uh, reality, so to speak, which is not to say that we've slipped through a wormhole and now live in the Batman universe, would that would so, um, so much as uh, adjusting to the way that life has changed in the last couple of months. So we've had assorted um scheduling issues some of which are for very good reasons um alex everyone will be pleased to note now has a puppy and the puppy is very rambunctious and loud and that means no pods from alex at the moment also marsh um is now over in america and has been able to finally uh reunite with his uh fiance over in new england and obviously that's awesome what this means for the podcast is that we've been navigating a lot of kind of scheduling complexity and things which meant that we've been less regular than we've been in the past when i think um i speak for all of us when i say it's been pretty important to us to get the kind of the week the episode out on that weekly cadence for pretty much the last eight years which is a terrifying thought <laughs> whoa i know i know um but nonetheless obviously like with uh with a kind of reduced regular cohort and getting used to the way that things might work where you know frankly at this point it feels unlikely that we'll go back to in-person recordings because we've we've scattered beyond bath even though tom you and i are still here oh yeah um what this really means in the short term is i don't have any big announcements to give so much is that we're going to have some conversations about um the best way to go about doing the podcast in the future in terms of timing um format other things we might discuss in order to kind of uh re-inject a bit of life but more importantly reliability into what we've been doing because i think we all like doing this we all want to keep doing it in one form or another but kind of appreciate that lately things have been a little bit chaotic the the final thing i would say on that is hopefully uh, anyone who backs us on patreon and we're very grateful for everyone who does understands that patreon supporters are only charged when we do an episode so there's no sort of um, out of pocket concern in that regard if we happen to miss one however we do understand that that support comes from a desire to see us do podcasts and so <laughs> finding ways to kind of make that all line up is a, a priority at the moment so no big announcements or anything scary like that just so much as to say that kind of to acknowledge that it's been a little bit up in the air lately as we've all figured things out um but we do want to fix it and we do want to make sure that we kind of figure out what what the right you know structure for all of this looks like that's all my um, business, at least. Should we talk bollocks for like an hour and a half now? Yeah, as long as it's about PC games and cool. nothing else. Cool, You're completely on brand today, and I really, really appreciate it. I'm on point, it. yeah. I've got yeah, exactly. Time. Um, good. Well, let's do some news, shall we? So um, there's, there's two pieces of news. I thought we'd kick off with, with something. So you've played um, Cyberpunk, right? I have. I've, uh, I completed it on PS4, and I have also got it on PC and played it here and there in fact quite recently interesting i have played it on pc and not finished it yet i took a, a big break and i was thinking about going back to it recently and then i realized that a new patch was on the horizon hmm. cyberpunk has now had its new update um but it's been a bit of a weird one um so this we're we're in the middle of the time blanked out on cyberpunk's big timeline for miscellaneous fixes and improvements and um i think it's going to be hard to talk about this without talking about comms in some way which i appreciate is close to the bone but the new the new patch is not groundbreaking um in any particular way and i very much doubt it's going to draw anyone back who's already feel like they made their mind up about the game so shall i run you through what has changed yes okay um and i want maybe 
maybe afterwards a sense of whether or not you feel like this is a um this has ignited anything in you of mm. any kind mm. um so the patch uh delivers a couple of free dlcs or cause kind of content um this content includes a alternative appearance for Keanu Reeves character Johnny Silverhand that can be enabled in a menu whereby he has slicked his hair back and is wearing a sort of John Wick style suit. Okay. Okay. Um, a jacket. Right. A, a jacket. Cool. A car. Got a few jackets in the game already. A car. Car. Oh, a car. Okay. A car. Hmm. That's it. Um, now, um, in terms That's of... It. In terms of content additions, okay. yes. In terms okay. of content additions. And then there's obviously assorted bug fixes um, and things, but the two big standout changes, um, or the, sorry, the three big standout changes are a reset button for resetting perks so you can reallocate them. Oh, cool. That's good. Okay. Um, uh, better minimap zoom while driving. So you uh, can now uh -huh. not miss corners quite as much as people did. Um, and a, you, you know, that mission where you go to the sort of like virtual reality, cyber therapy brothel. Yes. Yeah. Brain dance and or whatever at, it's called. Yeah. Yeah. The, and, and at the beginning you have to pick which cyber therapist you're going to see. Yeah. Um, well, pr the, the screen that lets you see what they look like stays on screen for longer now. <laughs> cool. 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 That's it. Can we backtrack? How good? How good was the car they added? How good's the car? Uh, well, I don't know. Um, tell me about the car. Um, it is. It, it's called the Archer Quartz Bandit. Um, and let me have a look. Uh, oh, I, those three things. It looks. It looks like a car. It's an orange car. Ooh. Oh, um, okay. Okay. Let's see. It has three hundred and sixty-four horsepower. A lot of horse. Um, it was uh, used in, in in Night City between the years of 2041 and 2077. The windscreen is made of glass. All Ooh. of these facts and more from the Cyberpunk wiki. Okay, yeah, um, okay. It has a standard door mount and a top speed of 170 miles an hour. Uh, it costs, and you'll enjoy this, fans of the sex number, 69,000 euro dollars. Sounds, sounds, like, um, sounds like a car. It has two doors, Tom. Okay. And not Hatchback? Two, <laughs> no, it's three doors. Uh, two seats. It's got a coupe mm -hmm. body, and it weighs two thousand five hundred and thirteen. But the actual the, 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 the grams, is... <laughs> it doesn't say. Um, <laughs> so, and what about what about what about the jacket though? Like, okay, let's find out. Let's find out about, let's the, find jacket. about the jacket. Yeah, um, it is called. You'll be pleased to know a multi-layered sin leather Delta Jock jacket in luminescent punk jacket. Oh wait, hang on. No, these are two jackets. I was going to I'm say very you can't. Sorry. You can't mix I have punk fucking slandered. I've slandered this. These are two jackets. There are two jackets. Please two jackets. amend whatever emotion you were having previously when it sounded like there were one. There was one jacket. Right. Um, um, let's see. Uh, is there a picture of the jacket? Uh, it seems like quite a shiny jacket. Um, is this the dude jacket? Is this the jock one or the or the punk one? The first one, the 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 luminescent punk jacket. It, it's like That's a punk jacket, fun. and it's pretty luminescent. Um, I'm struggling to find a picture of the other one. Uh, my sources here are Google Image Search, so that's not working. There is a um, there is what looks like it could be a video, but I don't want to risk uh, watching a video midway through recording a podcast because of. Um, I'm just terrified that I'm going to upset the ghost that lets us record podcasts over the internet, frankly. Um, nonetheless, nonetheless, um, that's the, that's the extent of Cyberpunk's 1.3 update. And as someone who's like most of the way through the game, I will, I, I appreciate the, I've done the quest where you can now see the people for longer. So that doesn't affect me. I won't change Johnny Silverhand's appearance because I think he's very handsome as he is. Um, I don't care about a new car because I ride a bike because uh, yeah, I do like the mini map change that was necessary, but could have been a mod and indeed is. Um, and I will try on the new jackets. That's a promise. Hmm. How, where are you at with this? So I've on my PC playthrough, I've not reached the brain dance brothel place where, so I will enjoy that longer screen. I think, I think I will benefit from that particular introduction. But yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. 
I'm also a bikeist in this game. Mm. Big big fan of bikes. It, also GTA actually for some reason in all of these sort of open world uh, city games. I do like a, the bikes just seem to be faster and better always. Yeah, uh, and also the bikes in um, Cyberpunk do actually really look really cool. They do actually mm. look like proper Akira style futuristic motorcycles. So yeah, uh, I mean a, a new car's kind of a nice thing. I think like the game might have more fundamental problems. Mm. <laughs> so perhaps the things. I mean, w- how is this kind of big patch? kind of sold to the world like uh, people seem to be looking forward to it but did they promise that it would be a big one particularly uh, they've done a, f- a weird job of putting this out there so the initial kind of announcement for the patch features was done in the universe as a series of like news articles with videos um like heavily drenched in law like in some cases several paragraphs of text just articulate that hey um this thing in a brain dance clinic has been fixed Mm-hmm. okay and like i can understand the desire to uh have fun with this but it if it felt a little tone deaf to me given the volume of issues around the game and that's not to say that a volume of ill will should be taken as a sign that you need to count out to it necessarily but cyberpunk really does have clear issues and it's hard for them to step around it. And the other side is that coming alongside this, I think a lot of this stuff was discussed in a live stream with developers. Who, and that is a tough situation to be in. Yeah. To, to be like um, visibly and, and personally, uh, you know, accountable for articulating the, the challenges when it comes to something like this and also doing so live, like that is, mm. uh, you know, very difficult. Um, and so, you know, basically huge respect and and sympathy for developers who are in that position however they're obviously put in that position and it doesn't feel like a good fit for this because it puts developers in a position where they're talking about how hard it was to do a pretty small patch and it doesn't raise confidence in the game as a whole Hmm. right and i think um i think they're still in a pretty tough place in that regard because obviously we can have some fun with how spare this feels but i have no doubt that those developers and those streams are right that like all of the there's the obviously and and there is a, a a bunch of sort of you know bug fixes and things that come along with this and um you know gameplay tweaks and things like that but relatively minor ones and i have no doubt that every one of those things had to be rigorously tested and implemented very carefully but ultimately i don't think any of this is going to um change the narrative about that game just yet because i think it's a good game i mean that's the flip side to all this right like i've had a good time playing it i'm just very conscious that i'm playing it on a very powerful pc that it 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 works on frankly yeah for some reason with it as well i've found it difficult to forgive it's just kind of jank uh Mm. because certain aspects of it are so beautifully observed and actually really beautiful to look at so uh, some of the guns are really nice to use and the abilities are fun um but then the sort of like pedestrians getting stuck in the background of a scene um i like we played the game again from the start i was you know got into a car with a really important fixer where it gives you a mission and there's a kind of drive through the city as you're doing it and it's uh it's dynamic like the stuff happening outside the windows isn't like pre pre preordained it's just the Mm -hmm. sort of uh the logic of the game at play as you're as you're cruising through it um sometimes just that there just won't be any pedestrians <laughs> yeah. and sometimes there just sort of won't be any cars either and sometimes parts of the game just don't appear to sort of exist for a bit and then i got out of the um got out of the car afterwards said my farewells to him took a call from best pal jackie uh a character i quite like a lot actually in that game um and uh then a car immediately crashed into the big gangster car that I was just in <laughs> and it was wedged in the middle of the road sideways completely t-boned as I greeted my call with Jackie and I stood there and watched it for quite a while just to see how it would like what the game would do because there's a really major character in that car <laughs> in, <laughs> in narrative terms in terms of like, the quest logic where that character sort of needs to be for me to actually kind of go and tell him that a job has been finished um and for the longest time he was just stuck in that t-boned car in the middle of the road as and uh, it, it's not all down to the, just one incident like that. It, it, the, the whole game is characterized by instances like that throughout. Yeah. Um, and 
uh, it is enormously difficult to produce open world games of that fidelity and not have this happen. And yet, yeah. I, f- I feel like Cyberpunk, for me, as an experience, is broken by that stuff. Uh, and whatever kind of weird invisible line that exists in my brain that lets me accept it, accept that level of jank, uh, Cyberpunk hasn't kind of reached that line, and nowhere near. Um, so I yeah. don't know. I think that I think there are moments for me where I did find it kind of transporting, and and I obviously spoke about the podcast before. Um, I think it has the power to kind of transcend some of that stuff. But you're right, like it's and it, it's like with this, it's like this whole thing, right? Like in in a sense, when those things happen in the game, the game is asking you to forgive it because it's trying to achieve something much grander on a bigger scale than yeah. That. But you are the player. You're 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 the you know. And I, I, I hate to break these things down in such a kind of like commercial way sometimes, but like you're ultimately like just the customer and they're in their store, right? You're just the guest in their theme park. You, it isn't your job to know how hard it is to run the rides. Right. You know what I mean? Hmm. And I feel like it's always a tricky line when devs ask players either explicitly or implicitly to go like, look, <laughs> this is hard. Like, you know, cause I, obviously empathy is, is absolutely a, the thing we should encourage, but at the end of the day, when a player is just playing the game, it's not on them to go, I'm just going to ignore the fact that this, you know, that Dexter Deshaun is stuck in a <laughs> car in the middle of a junction. Right. Yeah. Like, you you know, like it, it's like, it's like in a, if you go to see a play and something goes really terribly wrong, like some, some of the best things on YouTube, and I'm going to give Graham who will edit this some kind of, uh, show notes problem here is like things going wrong at school plays <laughs> like um there's a great series of youtube videos of kids attempting to do peter pan wire work in an amateur fashion which is like one of the best times you can have online as far as i'm concerned because it's mostly just like why did you think this was going to work <laughs> and why have you just catapulted wendy like bodily <laughs> through a very thin wooden wall to the shrieks <laughs> of her parents in the audience it's the funniest thing on earth <laughs> but but the point is when something goes wrong like that in a play there's this really awkward moment where the audience and, and the people putting on the school play both know like we kind of need to reset now because we just launched a <laughs> right, trebuchet yeah. style through the scenery. Uh, <laughs> the best one of these is one where Peter Pan is supposed to go through a window, but the people backstage <laughs> pull the wrong wire and yank Wendy out of bed with such force <laughs> that she screams. It's it, it's <laughs> honestly like I, I feed off this stuff like an energy vampire. It's, it's, it's delightful. But the point is in that moment, there's this weird compact between the audience and the show where you're like, okay, we understand you need to, needed to fuck up. We've all had fun here, but you need to give, you need to get, you need to get everyone to sit down. Everyone needs to breathe and we'll reset and we'll clap politely when you've unfucked it. Right? Like when the curtain goes back up again and the set's been fixed and everyone's in the right position and there's a slight nervy sort of wink to the audience of like, we know you saw. Everyone's going to breathe out, like laugh, clap, and we'll get on with the show. That can't really happen in something like Cyberpunk, right? Like the way to build that empathy in Cyberpunk would be Dexter Deshaun's car gets T boned and like one of the engineers pops up on your screen, like in a little window in window and goes, oh, fuck. That wasn't supposed to happen. Uh, hang on a minute. And like GMs it out of the way for you and you all have a good laugh and you return to the game. But it's, it can't expect you to have that kind of empathy with the situation. It's entertainment that you've signed up for. And particularly it's an immersive world that you've signed up to be immersed in. So I think you're right that it it, it is sort of, I hate to say unforgivable because I think it's like, there's so many mitigating factors that go along with anything that's ambitious. But yeah. It's like from a player's point of view, I don't see why the player should feel like they have to write it off or ignore those issues. I feel, yeah, I feel like I would be more uh, forgiving if there was some, almost like, I don't feel like I have ownership over my destiny in Cyberpunk, really. Mm. I think the reason why I forgive something like Skyrim endlessly or, uh, you know, Bethesda Open World mm. fantasy games endlessly is because in exchange for the total utter nonsense that often happens in those games uh it, it uh, due to the sandbox i do actually get a degree of autonomy that i value and have a sense of going on a cool right. fancy adventure that i am directing somehow whereas uh, cyberpunk i think for lots of reasons i think cause it's so directed in terms of the dialogue you're involved in and how scenes are kind of shot and moved around how people move around you as though a play is happening around you it feels as though i'm kind of 
it's being done to me <laughs> a lot of the time rather than yeah. uh, so I'm in the position as an audience member rather than a participant with cyberpunk whereas with a Bethesda game I feel like I'm sort of making the nonsense happen in part and I'm I am participating in the stupidity and therefore mm. I can forgive it because my own ego is involved and I can forgive myself endlessly <laughs> for kicking things over on a table or making an NPC do a stupid thing or fall off a cliff. Um, there's a, um, yeah. there's a, yeah, I think of a good moment of that. And there's a, there's a quest in cyberpunk um, where you have to stop a very upset robot car. Oh yes, by, I, I And it's not clear how you're supposed to stop it. It just to stop the car. So I initially like blocked it. I like ran it off the road with my car and I thought mm. that would be sufficient, um, but it wasn't. Um, and I ended up having to look it up. It's one of the only things I had to just like confirm what it was I needed to do. And what I would need to do is just do a certain amount of damage to the car. Um, and I ended up basically like alternatively standing on the roof of my car and riding around on the roof of the enemy car, just firing a pistol into its bonnet <laughs> as it freaked out, span around and just ran over civilians left and right. Many of whom would like get up again, stand completely still and be run over again. <laughs> and like I had, I had, I was successful. I think at one giving the game tremendous benefit of the doubt, like maybe working to immerse myself in some ways. Um, and that was a moment where I was like, I need to stop recording memories now. Like me, Chris, I need to stop having memories because like this just didn't happen. <laughs> right. Like my V did not do this, right? Like mm. there's definitely a version of this story where, yeah, you ran the car off the road in order to solve the problem. Great. If you were the GM of this role playing game, which is obviously the origin of this, that's where you say you've solved the problem. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but the kind of that, that bizarre, like, fiasco that then unfolded which involved a, like a lot of civilian caval casualties and weird cartoonish car physics like i just had to kind of like pretend didn't happen so i could get to the next part of the story and that's like that stuff is so rough and you're right i didn't feel like i had any agency i hadn't i hadn't brought about that situation by trying to do something weird i was literally just trying to play the game yeah yeah it's weird pretty, one. it's a shame with that because there are aspects of the story i actually really like yeah i really I, like a lot of it uh like i i think there's a fundamental, very kind of underexplored uh, narrative idea that, like, the tension at the heart of the game is actually: do you stand up to this, or do you go for a quiet life? Yeah. Uh, with like a yeah. lot of the, uh, a lot of the dilemmas are basically that, and that to me is like a fundamental everyday life problem <laughs> that mm. everyone deals with that is, is is that's rarely turned into drama. I think the the idea of using a kind of futuristic cyberpunk world where uh, you're at the whims of corporations, but then also it has these uh, this uh, lovely society on the outskirts of the city who you could choose to kind of move towards as well, who uh, wants to form a small community and try to escape. And lots of little really nice ideas for good stories are in this game. And yeah. some really good characters as well. Really and some nice really good writing lines. and some really good, really good performances. Yeah, yeah like totally. I think, yeah. I, yeah, I still, I still recommend it for, for its faults. It's just like I think it's. I mean, this won't be the final word in it because inevitably it will get more patches and more stuff, and we'll keep talking about it. But I feel like Cyberpunk is in the strange position of kind of should have been a cult classic. Mm. You know, should have been a Vampire the Masquerade Bloodlines. Yeah but it was produced with too much hype and almost too much resources. Like I don't think for the things it achieves, it couldn't have been done with less. Right. Yeah. yeah. They, and obviously like, you know, for all of the, for all the people dunk on its technical failings, it is also a remarkable technical achievement, which is the other side of that coin. Like you can't fail in the way it fails without succeeding in the way that it succeeds in terms mm. of the scope of that place and how it looks when it works. Yeah. You know, like they, they dialed it in to a, incredible standard that does not it does not hit consistently and that is its problem but it's always easy to forget to praise the fact that they got it to that level in the first place like you know um for all of that like i think it, you know it's a game that has a, like a surprising amount of heart and empathy and a lot of things to recommend it it's just you know it almost feels like it would be more comfortable as a like the first witcher game like a little cult classic that doesn't have too much laden on it, you know? Yeah. I, the way, it's, it's weird, though. Maybe it was a mistake because they sold a lot of copies of it. Uh, but with The Witcher 3 as well, like, they revealed so much of it so early. Mm. Years and years before anyone was going to even see it. Um, 
and like whenever that happens how could the audience not create an unrealistic expectation if if yeah. if if any given potential customer is is into the idea of a cyberpunk universe and you promise this incredible groundbreaking thing three years out and you show you some amazing kind of vertical slice uh impressions of what that might look like people are just going to build that up into the beautiful fantasy palace in their mind and it's never ever going to win <laughs> like critically it's never going to impress critics from that perspective because it's, everyone's expecting something that is never ever going to happen right. I think but, there's a middle yeah. ground there. Honestly, mm. I do. Like, I think, I think expectation setting is its own thing, and I think it's something that, um, I will say, it. Um, I think Cyberpunk failed at because I think the the lack of transparency about what that game was actually like right up to the end. Um, you know, my broader view on this is that big upsets happen in gaming when. Um, when there is a significant difference between what audiences are expecting and what they get. Um, mm. And when the shock of that um, realization, the shock of the truth, creates sufficient energy to generate uh, a backlash that becomes self-sustaining. And uh, I got a lot of thoughts about this because it's, it's a big part of what I do <laughs> to have thoughts about this sort of thing. But um, I think it is really important to both make good games, obviously, that is part of it, um, but also to let people know what they're going to get when they buy a game, hmm. you know, like um, I think in, in an ideal world, the after, you know, the, the video someone sees before they press purchase on Steam or on Epic or whatever, shouldn't be a hype trailer. Hype trailers have their place. It should be like a 10 minute gameplay video, you know, that's pretty explicit about what it is you're going to do in the game and, and what it's going to be like. And I think that leads to a better experience. It might lead to like lower hype in that moment, but I think that leads to a better overall um, response. And I'm not to say that like, I don't, Cyberpunk was in such a difficult and in some ways unique position, but they weren't very transparent at all, all the way through to the end. And therefore that, that sort of like castle in the sky issue that you draw attention to is absolutely there, but it can, it can be avoided or it can be mitigated. You know, there are always going to be people in the audience who take something and run with it um, to an extreme, despite evidence to the contrary. But the least you can do as a developer, I think, is give them evidence to the contrary, things to ground their expectations. Hmm. Um, and the absence of that empowers that kind of um, boundless optimism and it creates these moments. And like, and there's something interesting about the gulf in the way that that in the way it felt feels to talk about cyberpunk given like this time last year there was still basically nothing known about how the game would actually play or the granular details of it and we started this conversation by talking through some very granular patch notes that are like it's a different look for keanu reeves two jackets and a car you know what i mean yeah. like the 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 sort of um pre versus post launch kind of sense of what that game actually amounts to is is so different and like it shouldn't be necessarily mm -hmm. it's not to say that you issue these kinds of granular patch notes as you're making the game it's just about the the difference the amount of the, the amount of travel the audience has to do in terms of coming to terms with what something actually is yeah is that the Witch 3 did benefit a bit. They did show The Witch 3 quite early, and there, there was some backlash because they changed some post-processing on uh, one of the cities, and it looked different to earlier trailers. So there's always, mm. you do get that kind of stuff. But I, don't, I think that's pretty much, that's small potatoes, really, in terms of the overall yeah. impression of the game. Um, whereas, so The Witch 3, turns out, was based on The Witcher 2. You'd never expect with The Witch 3 to happen, <laughs> like even from that studio. Like, the the, right. the, the on-ramp, the, the ramp leading up to The Witcher 3 was surprising. The, the final kind of jump, the leap from two to three was so extraordinary uh, that it couldn't help but go down as being, I think it will be remembered as a classic of its genre because it kind of single-handedly also at the time proved that single-player RPGs, people still quite like them and they actually can be very, very popular and also just uh, yeah get very high on critical lists and that kind of stuff. Whereas Cyberpunk was kind of almost following on for The Witcher 3, but was also chose to make it a first-person shooter. <laughs> which is a whole different discipline. And then they wanted to make it this this absolutely groundbreaking, next-gen, beautiful future city. And in moments it is, and in those moments mm -hmm. it's extraordinary, but it was never going to do any of that. Maybe it's just, maybe they're just doomed by their own success, really, to an extent. Yeah. 
So maybe uh, what could they have done? Produced a smaller game that was. Uh, I mean, I know, you know. that's a big subject. That's a big yeah, subject. Yeah. I think there's. I think like probably, yeah, indeed. Um, I wish the other news story we had was uh, a light, uh, like, you know, look at what this ferret did kind of end of the news <laughs> type story rather than get into bigger industry topics. But it's not. Do we get into an even bigger industry topic? Let's do it. So um, the story this week, um, Fortnite gained uh, a mode called Imposters, which is very, very, very similar to Among Us, which is, uh, if, if you're not aware, the um, hugely successful kind of PC and mobile, uh, I guess, real-time multiplayer take on Mafia or Werewolf, like the kind of classic mm. um, social deduction, deception party game. Um, so Fortnite got this mode um and uh it follows the among us follow fo- uh, formula very 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 closely um to the point where the map is very similar the the structure of the gameplay is very similar with uh the sort of crew member players performing tasks and being picked off by imposters um and so on and this caused uh obviously i think some upset among the uh, in a sloth team who made Among Us, um, who reportedly weren't kind of consulted and in, in being involved in something like this. And it sort of led to, I guess, um, pretty bad feelings all around, but it, it raises, I think, a lot of fairly pertinent and quite interesting issues with regards to um, inspiration and, and duplication in games like this because to me this feels like a fairly transparent case of um not necessarily punching down but certainly taking from up like you know like epic and fortnite is so big that it seems telling that they felt compelled to just take from among us rather than reach out to work with them as they do with so many other companies and ips i have no idea what was or wasn't discussed behind the scenes obviously but it does seem like uh um in this case the 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 similarities are so apparent that it does seem a case of effectively treating among us as um unclaimed territory basically as um open season for this kind of imitation and it is such a fine line when a game or a genre or a mode is that way because after all fortnite's own success is grounded in being a um free version of battlegrounds frankly a battle royale game uh available for free in an engine that meant quick and robust you know um support for consoles and mobile which are a huge factor factor in the success of something like this and so but at that time people weren't necessarily saying that it was unfair for epic to swoop into an emerging genre and make their own claim on it in this case some people are saying that and it's kind of interesting to articulate the reasons why this feels unfair but maybe fortnite's initial foray into kind of genre lifting didn't hmm thing is though among us has borrowed from a lot of other games itself um and there mm. are lots of kind of digital versions of things like among us like you mentioned werewolf actually is kind of uh, is a brilliant part of game on similar lines but even stuff like space station 13 where you have lots mm-hmm. of uh, multiplayer environment lots of people on a ship with different uh agendas who can sabotage the ship and you know hilarity yeah. issues um there are so many mm-hmm. versions of this that have existed before and so uh, I, I don't like I don't doubt that uh, you know big budget studios are going to crib from people making smaller games that always happens. But Among Us has been very successful, and they've earned their success by borrowing from the other ideas that other people have made. True, I think I think the line here is that like you're right. Like a lot of games have tried to make Mafia or Werewolf work um, in a digital format over the years. I think. Among Us is notably one of the first successful ones Hmm. um, to achieve success in that particular way. Like, I think Space Station 13 is an interesting example, but I think its success was slightly different. Like, I think it was more to do with that kind of very niche emergent storytelling out of a multiplayer game kind of thing. 
um, among us made a, fen- like a slow phenomena, but a phenomena out of this by being successful at it. And this is where it gets interesting for me because it's like, in a sense, it makes sense for Fortnite to lift among us as solutions, right? The way they solve the problem of making this kind of game work in real time, online with strangers, etc., all of the different complexities. Um, in the same way that every battle royale game lifts the concept of the shrinking circle, hmm. the the kind of shrinking area of play that pushes players together and forces a resolution. That is a a mechanic that you know whose inheritance is owed to like the armor modding scene and the Minecraft modding scene. That comes from the problem. It comes from the Hunger Games. It comes from how do we create a conclusion to an open ended battle royale survival scenario. You know, it's it's a modification of the same sort of idea in the film Battle Royale, which was yeah. about sectors of the map being taken offline. Um, you know, it's certainly the case that these ideas get traded back and forth, and that Among Us is huge success is owed to the fact that it inherited a bunch of stuff and it fixed it, frankly. Um, and what I think, I think, what I my view on this is that I think if you are there's a there's a certain uh, unspoken um, way to go about entering a genre that someone else has come in and really figured out, hmm. you know? And I think it's a lot to do with um, if you are not going to work directly with those people, as, as Epic obviously didn't in this case, it's a lot to do with um, attitude. And I kind of mean that in like a both sense of like a direction of travel and the mood you express. I think because this imposters mode looks and feels so much like Among Us, because it's themed similarly, because the map is very similar, it invites this kind of bad feel where it's like, okay, you can inherit some of the mechanics that made Among Us work. You don't have to inherit the map design. You know, like you don't have to inherit the theme, the sci-fi theme, for example. Fortnite's very versatile in that regard. They weren't limited to that. And I think those are, that's where the bad feel comes from. I think there are ways to pay tribute to, to the thing you've inherited and then move it forward a few steps, invest resources in adding things that couldn't have been done in Among Us. Um, and that's but, where it sort of you justify the lifting effectively. Yeah, I, I find it interesting that the, uh, the bad feel here comes from lifting the not lifting the idea, but lifting the execution. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's like it's the, uh, the the refinement of this pre-existing idea is what people perceive Among Us to own here. Um, but can anyone own the refinement of a thing? I'm thinking of, you know, obviously, World of Warcraft comes from EverQuest. That was a matter right. of re- refining and making it more accessible and gaining a large audience as a result. Um, and mm. this seems to be quite similar on the surface in terms of oh it's a similar high, high fantasy vibe here it's a sci-fi thing um yeah but then the execution with extra resources potentially better um, I, I think i think i think that's the key thing though i think resources are the key thing hmm. right if you're Fortnite, you have your budget is n frankly for something like this and i obviously appreciate it. among us has been enormously successful but it's still not it doesn't compare Right, like Fortnite is the biggest game in the world by several orders of magnitude. Um, I think if anyone ever forgets how big Fortnite is, they should go look at the numbers because they're bigger than you think. Yeah, um, like it's 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 like twice as big as the next biggest game in the world. It's crazy. Hmm. Um, and so it feels like you want to see that stuff reinvested, reinvested in a really big way in order to like blow expectations out of the water and mean that like, okay, well it almost like sufficient reinvestment almost reframes this as tribute. Right. Um, whereas it's, it feels bad for, for anyone, any, any organization with so much power and so much, so many resources to like simply mimic what's already there and profit from it. What I find interesting is um, why we feel. I, I I agree with the sentiment. Actually, I do. I instinctively felt the same way when I uh, mm. heard this news. Uh, but uh, what I wonder is like why we feel the need to pay tribute to the creators of Among Us as opposed to anyone else on the chain of the development of that 
idea in that concept. Right, um, back to like Dimitri Davidov, <laughs> who did who invented right. mafia in the first place. Yeah, yeah. right. I, well, I think it's. I think I, I think there is a quick answer to that, which is that I don't believe anyone before them figured this out in a digital context. Hmm. Like, and I think the success of, of success of Among Us is testament to that. Like, um, you know, I've like I've played a lot of mafia and werewolf well in my life, a lot, and I think Among Us is the first video game to translate something of that experience which is like this is like a unique thing like like um i think werewolf is probably one of my favorite games ever yeah um in any context because it is like the most human thing hmm. right like you don't need any pieces to play it in a lot of circumstances or you can make it work without anything whatsoever it just it just takes human dynamics and turns them into game mechanics that create these amazing kind of emergent scenarios. It's really extraordinary. It's extremely hard to adapt to a deterministic video game environment. Yeah. And they pulled it off, frankly, and they pulled it off in the way that was not only like, and I think the crucial thing is they pulled it off for players who weren't looking for it to work. Like, um, space station 13 and these other like role play games worked because the players who were playing them that niche were invested in making it work so mm. they were doing some of the work of like holding the game together they're self-selecting as well like, yeah people, yeah it's, who want that type of experience were prepared to invest in it in way whereas that, yeah. among us is mechanics and the way that they paired away some of the complexity of mafia or werewolf and all the rest of it succeeded at making a game that could achieve that kind of depth and breadth for players who were super engaged and having it play work a certain way, but also provided sufficient guardrails that players with no interest in doing anything other than playing a video game had something like that experience. And I think that is a genuinely pretty singular design achievement. Mm. Like, and I think it deserves credit for that. And it's such a singular design achievement. I'm not surprised to see it lifted in a way. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, and I think, I, I don't know what you do in a scenario like this other than like pour one out for the little guy. <laughs> but it's like, you know, I can understand the bad feel this raises necessarily. Yeah, I, um, I understand it as well. Because I, I definitely feel it. I'm just like, oh, well, they put all the effort in and they, they nailed it. The small team. Yeah. They, they, they did it. Um, and now it's up for like... I don't imagine that any of these versions that big budget studios are going to make are actually going to improve on the formula. <laughs> really, I, I expect them to yeah. just be reskinned versions of it. But I think they've nailed it. They've done it, uh, and it feels as though uh, instinctively I have a deep sense of fairness that, to me, suggests that they should be o the ultimate people who benefit from that. But yeah. they, they, they they won't be. And what's hypocritical from my for me about examining my own reaction to this is there's also a ma matter of proximity. So if someone had looked back in six years' time at Among Us and then made it, I'd be like, oh, yeah, they've, they've taken this great, awesome thing that everyone loved and sort of bring it to a new audience. I'd, I'd be really happy about mm -hmm. that. But because it's so soon, too soon, <laughs> it's, it's so obviously like, a, oh, let's capitalize on this thing that people like, um, that somehow that feels cheaper. And yeah, well, actually sort of think about it logically. I'm like, eh, why? <laughs> well, I think, so here's, here's the thing. Here's a thought. Like, I feel like, Epic's angle on this. One thing Fortnite does is it seizes on cultural moments, right? Like that's one of the one of the unique positions they've put themselves in. They as a video game, like it's not just a video game; it's a venue. And in yeah. this venue, we host musicians and movies and other things that are happening in pop culture. And your time in Fortnite is not just time playing a video game or playing a video game with your friends; it's just a time being in culture. That's enormously significant. That's enormously significant to its success. And um, yeah, just a, a, a massive thing in its own right. Among Us is clearly a cultural moment. It is. It has been its success. Yeah. has happened alongside the pandemic. It's, um, it is a kind of little cultural touchstone in its own right. It's fed memes into the language. It's done all of these different things. And I think my suspicion is what they're trying to get away with is paying tribute to it in a very light touch way as if it's just just them tapping into this particular cultural moment like they're just going where the culture's going that doesn't work it would work however if this had been a collab basically mm, right like if this had been done in collaboration with them or it featured you know 
you know, Among Us characters, like Among Us style characters in Fortnite, and it was basically 3D Among Us and it ran for a bit. That would feel right. What's really stark about this, pun not intended, is that what it shows is that the owners of the particular cultural moment, whatever it is, get invited in when they are also a big player. When they are Star Wars or Marvel or Travis Scott, whoever else, or or, uh, Ariana Grande recently, um, they don't get invited in when they are indie developers. And that's kind of a bad look. And it it feels like an unintentionally bad look because Epic have done a lot to try and reach out and stuff like that. But like, it just, like, I don't know why. I mean, maybe it's just my particular lens. I keep bringing everything back to like bad comms, but like this, it just feels like, um, uh, they missed their shot in terms of the the pitching of this. And I think also actually, you know, audiences, people will obviously play this and have fun with it, hopefully, but like audiences also are quite sensitive to a missed cultural moment. And in a way, I think actually one of the silver linings for the Among Us team out of this is that the kind of bad feel about this and the fact that it's a kind of a meme that this has been kind of lifted or whatever is a testament to the fact that like audiences are kind of willing to side with the underdog and can see what's happened. Um, and it also means that it has the, the, the knock-on effect of meaning that Fortnite's kind of missed its moment in this regard, probably. Hmm. Which is obviously relative because it has hundreds of millions of players. So it missing its moment means more people play it than play any other game release this year. The, the sort of, the, just the brute force nature of the size of the audience yeah. means that the number of people who play Fortnite who are even ever going to know about this is probably infinitesimally tiny. Uh, right. So they could, the, the bad feel will be extremely minimized and well, contained within a few Fortnite threads and this podcast. <laughs> and Twitter. Um, I mean, this is Twitter. the thing, right? Like, well, this is this is the reality of things, right? Like, you mm-hmm. can be too big to fail, but you can't be too big to piss off Twitter. That's the... <laughs> that's always true. <laughs> that's the, uh, the moral of this story. And it's not a moral nor a story and that's where that ends and so does my glass of wine incidentally <laughs> we talk about some of the games we've been playing because i appreciate well, having used for a big long time what have you been playing tom uh so i've been i've gone back to uh marvel's avengers and this mm, will, actually speaking yeah, of oh, there's a segue there lost the time never mind um how have you found it yeah so i like this game uh but i struggle to recommend it still uh, even though it's had, uh, there's, I, to me, there are quite a few true lines to Cyberpunk. Weirdly, in that it's a game I very, very much want to meet it halfway and make it work for myself in whatever way I can. Um, and also, it's fundamentally it's a kind of session Diablo game where you play as the Avengers and Marvel's awesome array of superheroes, which is growing mm-hmm. um, with every expansion. They added Hawkeye. Um, I think like a, not one but two Hawkeyes. Two Hawkeyes. Uh, Count them, two. Two whole Hawkeyes, and now uh, Black Panther. And these are kind of added with, uh, like, the characters are fully featured. Uh, kind of RPG characters with their own skill sets, their own style of play. And the, also, they come with little campaigns as well that kind of introduce them. Um, mm-hmm. And the idea of, the, of Marvel's Adventures is amazing. The actual kind of on-paper thing of having this kind of drop-in, drop-out, co-op if you want it to be, uh, session action game where you play as your favorite Avenger, level them up, and then maybe every so often earn a cool new skin for them. Uh, and then every six months or so, maybe three months, there's uh, a new character added until you build up to uh, a huge roster of dozens and dozens of amazing superheroes that look incredible. Uh, the This model has been accomplished before by, uh, I think it's called Marvel Ultimate Alliance. Yeah. Uh, which yeah, yeah. Is, uh, I played I played a lot of on Switch. And that is a kind of like a top-down squad-based action RPG uh, where you basically just collect superheroes uh, like Pokemon and then switch between them during combat. And it's uh, big, dumb fun that is very good fan service, I think, actually, even though like the Switch can barely run it. Um, and that's kind of what this could be, except, again, I think the level of fidelity creates a degree of expectation that it cannot meet, uh, particularly when it comes to... Uh, combat itself mm-hmm. where like it's incredibly ambitious in that you've got all of these superheroes who can move around in wildly different ways 
and they have somehow designed maps around all of them uh, and still let you fly as Iron Man or leap, you know, multiple stories as the Incredible Hulk. And the whole game finds this incredibly awkward middle ground for all of them <laughs> uh, that doesn't quite satisfy any of it, any of the fantasy. Uh, so if you want to be Iron Man, you could fly. And uh, the animation works so, so hard to make it look as though you've boosted into a kind of new type of speed. Like the camera backs off and then, you know, your character briefly just bursts away from the camera and then the camera catches up as though somehow uh, your character is outrunning you. Uh, but then you realize immediately that you're moving about four miles an hour uh, and very slowly kind of gliding face first across the surface of uh, quite samey landscapes in order to mash X and Y and then punch some aim goons in the face until they explode. Uh, and also punch them a lot, by the way. It has a classic <laughs> problem of just even the most basic enemy having a health bar that's way too big. The Hulk hits you once, you stay hit forever. <laughs> but <laughs> in, in this game, you... You, you just like you could again the animation is incredible he raises his hand above his head you hold down y and then he just he, he moves as though to slam both of his fists into the earth and then he's sort of like actually the hulk realizes that that's not powerful enough so he, he's like moves up and winds up even further it's like he's building up even more power then he hits it and then uh two the number 251 pops out of an enemy and they fall over and then they get back up and you realize that the health bar is about a third diminished um <laughs> And the whole game, unfortunately, has this, again, the, the fantasy just fighting against the mechanics endlessly. Uh, and there's, there's, of course, a kind of loop train that you're on where you're gradually getting only equipment that improves certain abilities. It makes you kind of, I don't know if you're uh, the Hulk, gives you gamma radio radiation effects on the third attack of a combo or something like that. Mm. So, sounds sounds cool, sounds kind of gritty. Um but there's a fundamental problem uh, in these games that want to give you a kind of stat treadmill with this sort of loot uh, is, is that like the stats exist to be there if you want them. That doesn't work at all in a challenge context because yeah. in order for stats to be there if you want them, they have to be just meaningless enough to be ignored <laughs> so for people to, for you to be able to completely ignore them, in which case they may as well not exist. Uh, mm -hmm. So you're basically just fiddling with uh, a calculator in the background, and it might you might maybe kill an aim goon in four hits instead of six. No one cares, and it's not a satisfying forward progression, and it kind of uh, obscures the fact that fundamentally you want to just be the superhero for twenty minutes and feel the full force of that superhero's mm -hmm. power, and not have to worry about any of that stuff. Um, and it's it's the it's the the desire to be a living game that clashes massively with its fantasy, in a way that uh, I don't know for something like Destiny, but you get to precisely control the fantasy of what you are in that universe and what you can do. Mm -hmm. um, whereas everyone who's very familiar with the Marvel superheroes know that uh, know what the Hulk can do, <laughs> and you're playing with him. And as much as all the animation as the sound effects are telling you that you're doing it, you know you're not. It's fundamentally, this, the fantasy is not being served to its fullest, um, which is really unfortunate. And also, it's still really janky. Like the sound just breaks all the time, so just entire tracks of the uh, of the sound will just vanish for me. Uh, wow! So it'll, it'll cut to someone else in a cutscene. The cutscenes are very well directed, really well acted. They've got really good voice mm. actors in. I think the writing is really solid. I really like the stories that they're telling, telling with these characters. Uh, they suffer massively from being sort of slightly off-brand movie universe versions of what people are familiar with. But once you, if you if you put that to one side, actually, it, it's, the characters are great. I, th I really like their version of Tony Stark and their version of Bruce Banner and their version of uh, Kamala mm -hmm. Khan as well. Um, is it Kamala Khan who's... It is, yeah, Miss Marvel. Yeah, she, she's fantastic in that game. Uh, and it's, it's kind of, it's a real shame because there's so much good stuff in there. But it doesn't cohere into something that. Serves so the, well. does the like, War for Wakanda stuff change that at all, or is it just more of the same issues? It's more of the same issues, um, and it's a, it's a shame because, like, loads of effort's gone into it. Um, Black Panther's awesome. He's uh, a kind of, it's kind of like a. Uh, he plays a bit like a Mortal Kombat character in that he's a really fast martial artist. 
Mm -hmm. And uh, so he's very, he's very flippy, but he can he kick multiple people in a row, a bit like you can. Uh, <laughs> I, love the, I love that as a description of martial arts. <laughs> that's all I care about. Like, I'm very flippy, but I can that, kick multiple people. <laughs> that's a martial art to me. <laughs> yeah. I, I know when a martial art has happened, when uh, I see him. When multiple, kick multiple people have been kicked, kicked yeah. by a flippy man. And, uh, and yeah, but I did absolutely excuse that. And uh, he, yeah, that, that's really good. <laughs> <laughs> martial, art, martial art has occurred here and i'm uh, i'm i'm pleased uh and that is they've got um christopher judge to voice him and christopher judge um he was mm -hmm. in the stargate series and also mm. he voiced kratos and he's, he's he's brilliant yeah it's an amazing act absolutely brilliant like his vocal voice is fantastic on it the writer's great uh T'Challa is... That's a great casting as well, actually. It's really yeah. good. It's spot on. And uh, I'm playing it, like, it's the sole reason I'm still playing it, honestly. Uh, it's seeing, kind of, like, just having mm. seen T'Challa, that version of T'Challa they've envisioned, who's actually um, in the Marvel film, which is pretty much my only uh, experience with Black Panther as a character. Uh, T'Challa was kind of, like, real, like, putting on his raiments, kind of becoming the Black Panther into an origin story. Whereas yeah. here, in this game, he already, like, he is largely in charge. Like, he is totally... he's. The king, yeah and he's mm. in place and actually when uh it drops kind of captain america and iron man in there and they're just like like it's really well judged in that they they defer to him because he yeah. is the established ruler of yeah. this place and, and this king uh, which is spot on it's great and it's, that makes me a great character to play and also uh just makes me really care about you know saving wakanda wakanda itself is again beautifully realized Again, it suffers from being a bit too close to the movies because the, the film is just absolutely just the kind of it's the splendor of the place. It's just mm -hmm. it's a beautiful thing to watch for a few hours. And in this, it's kind of like what kind of light <laughs> like that, but you're not gonna. They can't do. They can't give you the establishing shots, the kind of sense of scale, and uh, actually show the, the the population who lives there and, and properly. And so it, it can never quite realize that stuff. Um, so it's it's very much feels like the the they just gesture just enough at the f amazing fantasy they're trying to realize this brilliant Marvel universe. And then it's kind of like runs up, hammers up against all these limitations uh, constantly, which is a real shame. I really want to keep playing it. So I wanted to become Marvel Ultimate Alliance. And yeah, the, 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 the mitigating, the reason why I like Marvel Ultimate Alliance succeeds is because it's Diablo. Uh, it's because it's Diablo. <laughs> 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 it's because it's Diablo. And also because it's, almost it's not trying as hard and that's a terrible thing to mm. that's not it's a terrible thing to, to to be a criticism really it's not trying to be as lavish it's not trying to show you everything that marvel's avengers you know is trying to show you it's going to be a top down it's going to be lots of corridors corridors there's going to be lots of robots and you're going to punch them with spider-man and occasionally you'll get sure a wall but you won't care whereas in this like again it's it, the, the the trappings of the whole thing and the, the huge production values that gone into it just make every little moment that yeah wrong ever so glaring uh, they expose those limitations right like yes absolutely if like i think i felt this because i played through the entire campaign of the original game but i haven't played it since dlcs came out um it is probably the most data that i have pointlessly downloaded <laughs> so my, much my, so my ps my ps4 slowly inflating with marvel avengers data yeah, um, what kind of expansion is like thirty-two gigabytes? Jesus Christ! I don't quite know where that's gone. <laughs> to be honest. Um, and like, I think it's the thing. It's, it's interesting because, like, God, the same. Actually, a month after we launched this podcast, because it will have been summer twenty thirteen, I reviewed Marvel Heroes, which was the first attempt to do an MMO out of the Marvel Ultimate oh, yeah. Alliance formula. Mm -hmm. Um which was many of its own issues. It was an isometric game. It was sort of uh, like um, heavily free to play, very very aggressively monetized. You're like paying 20 quid to play as Iron Man, that kind of thing. Yeah, I remember. Um, and um, it failed because of its uh, grasping business model, basically. It failed to kind of become ultimate. Because like the thing that made Ultimate Alliance works is worked is with like, the generosity of characters on offer made you yeah. forgive the fact that it's crammed them all into this Diablo formula, which is never going to be perfect for that mm. roster. Right. Mm. Um, like I remember getting the phrase horizontal Spider-Man stuck in my head, <laughs> like, cause I was playing, <laughs> playing Marvel heroes and I couldn't get around, couldn't get away, couldn't get away from how wrong 
Spider-Man feels as a isometric Diablo hero. Yeah. Because he's totally defined by that kind of like vertical freedom. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, that's his whole fantasy. It's like you can rocket yourself up over the streets of New York with a flick of your wrist. And so to see him rendered as just like quite a fast punch man was like almost like kind of like devastating but it put this like the the notion of horizontal spider-man is like now i think a kind of i would like that to stand as a sort of issue that you can level at a game like this and i think i think the new avengers game can't get away from the problem of horizontal spider-man yeah definitely um it's 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 low flight ceiling iron man in its case yeah um but like um you know there's this sort of surrounding issue of like Again, it's this thing of like asking players to accept limitations because the the task the developers have set themselves demand it. Like, we want to accommodate all these different heroes in one setting, therefore you've got to accept that none of them are going to feel good. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, that's the <laughs> it's, it's like, it's do I have to accept that? Do I? Because as you say, the rest of the presentation I really, really, really liked. I really liked the story they told in that universe. I think I think I said this on the pod at the time, but I think they did a as good a job as could have been expected of carving out their own space in that universe, given how monumental a task it is yeah. to wrestle the focus away from the movies. Uh, just re- like talk about Spider-Man. What Spider-Man introduced to you? I was playing on the Miles Morales uh, mm. sequel to the PS4 Spider-Man game, which yeah. I, I really liked. Um, just all, all the, all the best Spider-Man games from PlayStation 2 era onwards have succeeded based on the swinging between buildings like that. Just absolutely feels incredible in the new games. Mm-hmm. And uh, Miles Morales is a great character as well. And uh, yeah, the entire city, the entire game has to be built around Spider-Man and what he can do. But yeah, that you can't compromise on that because in Marvel Ultimate Alliance, he's just a kind of glue bomb man <laughs> he's, just a sti- he's just a sticky boy he's just a sticky lad who puts the stickiness around him sometimes and occasionally people will get kicked and a martial art will occur and i'll be happy with that but it fundamentally <laughs> the differentiating thing factor is that sometimes he spins around a lot and there's an area of effect glue attack <laughs> and that is essentially what like all of the char- characters have reduced to that sort of thing in some way like uh, yeah, Iron Man has Thor lasers. makes people poorly from too much electric. He does do that, and again, animation is absolutely fantastic for his electrical attacks. It feels incredible, but uh, ten points of damage to a robot. <laughs> um, it's like, <laughs> what, are we, what are we all doing here? <laughs> I'd actually forgotten about how much, how often, like people, are like, well, we can't do web swinging. So, what Spider Man's other thing? <laughs> Gluing people to things. Yes, yeah, like that's his thing. That's that's the thing he does. Iron Man just kills people. Spider Man glues them to things. <laughs> glues them. So what a killed prankster. later by Iron Man. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> in this in this <laughs> telling, yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I it's it's a shame. So much effort has gone into this, Chris. So much effort has gone into this this game, and the faces they made and the voices they the, the words they did they make some say, faces. Yeah, and the, the, and the faces those say. people who do the voices made. Yeah, that exactly. too. All of Mo-cap, that. that's called. Uh, and for what? <laughs> for, <laughs> uh, for a game that... Uh, admittedly, I will play it every time an expansion comes out. And to be fair, I didn't uh, yeah. pay for this one. I think... It, I'm not sure if it's free to everyone or whether I accidentally think it bought is. some sort of big, massive <laughs> version of it. <laughs> I'd love... To, so, yeah, that that has to be the standing statement about the state of anything in 2021, right? Yes, I don't know yes. if this is free or if I bought it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, kudos to the, you know, the marketers... <laughs> <laughs> Truly, I have no idea. <laughs> free, I this thing. A free, or an amiable trick? We'll never know. Um, yeah, it's, it's the modern sentence that is. Oh, subscribe to this and get this free. I was like, no, but I, but I subscribe to it. <laughs> I paid money for for access to it. Um, yeah, honest so, to God, though, uh, not to segue out of um, Avengers into what I've been playing, but like everything I've been playing lately that isn't um, uh, an MMO that shan't be named probably till next week when they have news has been because it's on game pass which is also the case of like is this free or was i tricked <laughs> like, <laughs> which is again the way we live now yeah absolutely i don't i don't really have much more to say about uh marvel's avengers at the moment I'm, i can't think my dream for it is that they will somehow <laughs> find a hero who's just mediocre enough to exist within the boundaries of the game successfully <laughs> mm. 
<laughs> Which is a cruel thing to say, you perhaps. <laughs> no, I think they, I think that totally does exist. I think, as someone who's a bit of a nerd, I think they could do, like, Moon Knight, Black Knight. Any of the knights, honestly. Put Any of the Marvel there. Universe knights. Um, a, uh, maybe a, a Daredevil. Oh, that's, yeah, yeah. Maybe a Daredevil. Like he... Daredevil's a pretty good choice. Um, you know, maybe Iron Fist to wash that, taste that Netflix show out of yeah. everyone's mouths. They can, yeah, it's someone who could do a medium-sized martial art in a medium-sized environment. <laughs> uh, well, essentially fulfill what's needed here. A biggish, a biggish karate chop in a biggish room. Yes. All we need. The best expansion. What have you been playing, Chris? So I, I played a few things. So as I say, like I've had this experience recently of remembering that I pay for game pass and then like going, Oh God, look at these games. Mm. Um, so there's two things I've been playing lately. Um, one, uh, both of which I think have almost become little comfort games for me. Like things, one is, is much more recent than the other because it's been a little while since we, we spoke. Um, but, uh, the first one I want to talk about is project wingman. Ooh. So project wingman, uh, which is by, uh, sector D2 is a, um, sort of arcade dog fighting game, uh, heavily inspired by the Ace Combat series. And Ace oh. Combat, if you're not familiar, is basically like it's arcade dog fighting, but with like a veneer of realism. Like it's very much a veneer. It's got like that Clancy, Tom Clancy veneer of realism. Ace Combat traditionally Japanese from but Japanese developers has that kind of like uh, that particular lens. This is an, uh, uh, Project Wingman is such an interesting thing because it's, um, I think the, the developer is Australian, I believe. Um, and apologies if I'm wrong about that, but it's very much a tribute to Ace Combat. So it inherits a bunch of its ideas while also being very much kind of its own, its own specific thing. So um, there are two sides to the game. There's a, a campaign, which is like, you know, a linear kind of progression as you kind of unlock planes as you go and, and take on missions, uh, I guess, against various kind of strategic backdrops. And there's a conquest campaign where you um, kind of, which is a bit more, ad, bit more kind of self-directed, where you conduct sorties to take over sections of a map and pay for the upkeep of your squadron and new vehicles, equipment and pilots, etc. as you go. Um both of which work in a, a fairly um, fun and like my getting into this basically started because I had loaded up the Xbox app in order to download all 800 gigabytes of flight simulator or however big oh. it is now. Oh, yeah. um, and then I realized that what I wanted to do was just fly a plane in a big circle. So I downloaded this instead um, because it was free or I was tricked as has been established. Um, <clears throat> and um, it really has that, um, pleasant like i find flight simulators like this particularly arcade ones on a medium difficulty setting quite relaxing hmm. i think that's maybe not the vibe they want you to what, what they want you to feel when you're kind of plunging into a war zone but it's a a game of sort of like gentle sorties against mixed ground targets and another aircraft um which is a lot about flying fast you know plunging above the cloud layer getting a target lock letting some missiles go circling back around for another pass, getting those missile locks, cycling your targets, and kind of uh, maybe lining up some bombing runs and then continuing. Um, it looks really nice. Um, it has VR support, which I haven't actually tried yet. I've been playing mostly just with a pad, like um, normally. Um, but it does look nice, and there's a nice differentiation between like above the cloud layer and below the cloud layer for this stuff, that kind of Top Gun um, feeling. And I think it's quite successful as an embodiment of, of what I personally got out of Ace Combat Games, which was that sort of low stress kind of modern-ish dogfighting thing. Um, from what I understand, because I felt the need to have a more like informed opinion about this because I'm not like an Ace Combat diehard by any means. and I don't feel qualified to talk about how it, it changes or improves on that formula. Hmm. But uh, I did read somewhere a person say that the AI was pretty good. And then the next time I played it, I checked it out and the AI is pretty good. Like in terms of both your allies and the enemy kind of doing intelligent things during the battle, meaningfully, you know, challenging targets and so on. Um, 
it's um it's a really interesting production because um i think it's successful in all these terms there's some there's, there's there's a bunch of sort of weirdness so you can play in in the sort of traditional ace combat third person you can play in first person but without a cockpit so just the kind of aircraft heads up display or you can play in like a fully kind of 3d cockpit and they've invented loads of the 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 roster of planes is a mix of like real fighter jets and i think some made up ones and in some of the made up ones you literally cannot see at all in the in the cockpits because they've made some interesting sci-fi decisions so all that stuff feels a little bit off to me Hmm. but the the other side to it that i find equally kind of charming and occasionally off-putting is there's a thing with these games in uh, particularly the Ace Combat series where they're very plot heavy and this is no exception. And um, so the setting is this. It's set in the future, actually, despite having a lot of modern planes. The notion is there's been a huge global volcanic catastrophe and 300 years in the future, the world is kind of reset around a new world order. And it is completely one of these like convenience apocalypses <laughs> that allows them to present something like a modern military conflict, but with none of the existing countries in place, <laughs> yeah. but or like just a different name for California. We'll settle for that. Basically one of like, like a kind of neutral volcano apocalypse <laughs> that ends in everyone getting given a jet fighter, which is rad. like, <laughs> it is rad, but it's also like a very specific kind of apocalypse. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, but weirdly recognizable from like, um, games generally. It's like Tom Clancy's idea of the apocalypse is like, well, you know, when the end comes and the earth rises up and uh, ecological catastrophe ravages the planet, I suppose every civilian will only have one F-22 um, each. And, you know, so this is a story of mercenary companies intervening in the war between New World Order mega states in the space elevator future of space year 20, like six thirty three or something. Hmm. But it's basically just you're flying over some fields in an F-22, but there's a space elevator. Like, that's basically it. And some of the planes are very big. Bigger than a normal plane. I can promise you that. Sort of helicarrier-type big planes. The sorts of things you wouldn't see in reality. Um, and that that is all sort of faintly charming. It is, however, also, like, quite overwritten. Like you, you can skip the the briefings and things, but in the campaign particularly, nobody ever under any circumstances shuts the fuck up. Um, and a lot of the dialogue is like slightly overwritten in the way that a work email can be slightly over, slightly overwritten, <laughs> right. like like slightly over formal. Like it is deeply invested in like military speak, mm-hmm. but also like the the way the sentences run on is occasionally like, I wouldn't have time to unpack this sentiment. If my, if my air base was being bombed, um, one of, uh, so, and I know that it's like, it's a bit kind of an old, like, and and one thing I want to caveat this with is like, this is definitely like a labor of love to make an, an ace combat game basically. And, and also like such a good faith effort, I think from the people involved that I don't want to, Don Cannon's regard rather than sort of fondly kind of talk about my experience of playing it. Um, Cause I have really enjoyed it. Um, and in, in, in some cases, like the, the, the voice acting varies from um, extremely sort of professional sounding, like, Oh, you've got an American VO um, who is perhaps on a Dungeons and Dragons stream all the way to like, your friend did this. And that's <laughs> like charming more than anything else, actually, when it happens. Um, and um um but like the writing is like has created actually maybe accidentally some of my favorite barks in a while and i appreciate oh, cool. we've got like a line in good barks oh yeah one of my favorite ones was like i swooping low over the water in my fighter jet i unleashed a salvo of missiles and a, a row of patrol naval patrol craft on the bay below right like kicking off some of the spray from the water as i pulled back up into the atmosphere and one of its conceits is you can all one of the reasons no one ever shuts the fuck up is you can also hear everything the enemy is radioing to itself cool like you have everyone's radio all of the time are secure. and just hearing a little man in the background going my boat is not operable <laughs> as it is nuked to pieces by a missile oh, his boat really was fun. not operable 
it's not very good. But anyway, so like it's all this like it's just tons of talking all the time, and then like um, during a, mi- a mission recently, I genuinely thought that I was blacking out because it got really <laughs> weird. At one point, one of the one of the characters who's in your squadron, who's like one of the regular characters who's flying with you all the time, just went like just like clicked onto the com to go pickle pickle. And then signed off again. And I was like, "Am I? Am I dying? <laughs> like in real life? Like what? What the fuck was that?" And then, like in that particular mission, the notion is that you're kind of um, swooping in to save the day as Allied forces are under attack from from an enemy ground army, and so you're hearing like the distress of your allies on the ground as you swoop in to save them. And someone shouted, "Where's Ben? He's got the man pads." <laughs> And I don't know who Ben is or where he is or what man pads <laughs> even are. What the fuck is a man pad? I don't know. Especially it, in a war footing context. Like, where's Ben? <laughs> is he all right? <laughs> where's Ben? Is he safe? Um, and so that killed me. I, like, as I'm fucking cruising around, like, um, above the, above the earth. And like, it, it's, it's a lot of that, basically. It's, um, it's uh and this uh, culminated actually i think the mission before that ends in one of the best setups for a joke i have ever seen that doesn't deliver unfortunately and this Aww. is the only damning component of this so you get your first like occasionally you get these boss battles where you're up against like a significant enemy and this, you know you know it's a significant enemy because you get the health bar along the bottom of the screen mm. right and in this case you're up against your first enemy squadron that is a match for yours so you get this kind of segmented health bar down the bottom of the screen where every segment is a member of their squadron, basically. And they are called, and maybe this is a joke, and I would love to know if this is a deliberate joke or a joke among the community or something, but they are called Crosstalk Squadron. <laughs> okay. And it is the biggest setup and miss in the world for me that they're like, squad- like Crosstalk Squadron's here. Crosstalk 1, standing by. Crosstalk 2, Crosstalk 3, standing by. <laughs> <laughs> Like the fact that they missed that might be a crime or it might be the joke. I'm not sure. Uh, but it is the <laughs> like that's stuck in my head ever since is like the best setup for a bit that I can't now. Let that's so good. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's really good. Yeah. This is Crosstalk 4. I'm going down. Crosstalk 5. I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> this is the uh, best pop the trailer on it's it's um reassuringly orange for some reason but it's yeah it, it's, it's orange sometimes thing. it's blue sometimes it's green those are the three colors of planes you go very fast starts to explode this is this this is like game i will play i think you would like it yeah i think i think it's i think it's in the it's got it's in a, it's a it's in the deep sevens but the soul of an eight like it's it's i, I, I think that. yeah it's it's a nice little experience like i think a lot of my i think i've always been a big softy for, for stuff like this particularly because it's a labor of love to an existing series but it being on Game Pass helps a little bit, I think. Mm. Like, I'm not sure what I expect from it as a full price game, but um, I am really enjoying it as something to noodle away on, um, outside of that context. Oh yeah, I'd have to check this out. I've been really enjoying Game Pass. Just beat the Ascent um, on Game oh, nice. Pass as well. How did you find that? Uh, I really enjoyed it because it wasn't long enough for me to care about the fact that some of its systems don't make any sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I just shot things for about eleven hours. And it looked absolutely insanely beautiful while I was doing it and delighted, absolutely delighted with it. If they release an expansion or a sequel, I'll definitely play it. Amazing. Spoke, chatted about it a few episodes back. So if you want to know more about that, it's The Ascent. Back was in time. Yeah. Top down. Um, The other thing I've been playing, which I could talk about briefly, is Humankind. Ooh, Amplitude's Um, new. Yeah. Ooh, I'm really excited to play this. Yeah, also via Game Pass. So, um, this is a grand strategy game um, by Amplitude, who made the Endless series, so Endless Space, Endless Legends, etc. Um, humankind is their sieve. That's the way, that's that's what it is. Yeah. It's their sieve. Um, and so much so, actually, that like the presentation of the game is absolutely gorgeous. Um, when you begin the game, you get this opening cutscene, which is written in a slightly tongue-in-cheek way. Some of the writing is really fun um, about... Um, sort of setting the stage for life on earth basically just it's it, you know it is very civ in the sense that like we're here to kind of tell the story of human civilization but through the means of competitive board game basically hmm. um competitive strategy and we're going to kind of we're going to 
draw attention to the grandeur of the human story rather than get lost in the the details um that make everyone sad um, so the opposite of Twitter, <laughs> effectively. <laughs> like I would describe civilization's attitude to humanity as basically the opposite of anyone's day to day experience of being human, which is like the hum- the 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 Civ point of view is well, if you take a long enough view, we really tried, didn't we? <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but probably in the voice of Leonard Nimoy or something like that. Mm, you know what I mean? It's like reassuring. You, yeah, exactly. It is reassuring. Like you gave it a good go. That's a solid B, humanity. Now, burn to death. Um, and and so, you know, uh, humankind has its own version of this. And it culminates in this line, which is like, you know, it, it takes you through from the origins of amniotic life on Earth through to the birth of humanity and our nascent struggles to exist as a species. Um, and then to this moment where it kind of culminates in the birth of human civilization and i couldn't believe they were going to end the intro (laughs) on the word civilization Civilization. and so and then immediately and i think someone internally also realized this there's a line after it which is like and the journey of humankind (laughs) (laughs) the name of our game actually um and um it's uh it's very funny um the game itself is a, so I, I want to caveat this by saying I haven't finished my first, I'm 170 turns into my first campaign. Hmm. So, which feels like early doors for a game like this, right? Yeah. I feel like you've got to kick its tires a little bit. So this is going to be very much first impressions only. The other side to it is like, I've never been like a hardcore, like competitive Civ player. Civ for me probably delivers something I didn't know to call a clicker experience until clicker games existed. Yeah, which is about growing something interesting. Like I don't know if it's competitive. I don't know if it's good. I'm gonna, you know, Sid Mayer has talked about offering interesting decisions at a certain cadence. Hmm. For me, half of those decisions are creative. They're about what kind of civilization I want to be, whether or not it's optimal, that kind of thing. And um, so I've been playing very much in that mode, but I have been really enjoying it. So there's um to me like my my kind of overall take to get out of the way is that it feels a little bit thin in some ways Mm. um in terms of like it's a very successful like articulation of the civ formula particularly from like a few civs ago like i would say like civ four civ five nice um but it feels like it's got all of the bits to do that right but not a lot more than that like you know how all of these games launch but then become themselves when they get an expansion (laughs) right that basically Hmm. like i can like it feels like they've they've successfully launched 1.0 of this thing that i can imagine feeling richer with work Hmm. um that feels like a fairly common experience in this genre um the ui and the flow of it is just absolutely gorgeous like it's, it's way of surfacing what you need to pay attention to is amazing it's way of um drawing your attention to certain things and like when you get into the flow of a, of a game as i have been for the last hundred turns or so the ability to quickly make all the decisions you need to make in a turn and move on is is really quick so much so that you can like blast through most of a campaign in a couple of hours um which feels really really good um it's other kind of big innovations which both bear talking about is are the fact that like you don't pick a civilization at the start <clears throat> So the way it works is you begin as a undifferentiated Neolithic tribe and you have to achieve a certain number of stars to advance to the next layer of civilization. And this is true for any part of the game, but it's a bit quicker at the beginning. And so the beginning of the game, this mad race to like slay mammoths and find interesting rocks and do whatever it is to expand the kind of capabilities of your initial civilization at which point you get to pick a civilization to be for the next era. And these are first come, first served. So it's like a scramble to like grab the the bonuses you want for becoming the Babylonians or the, you know, ancient Mayans or, or something like that. Um, and then you enter the next stage. And as you progress, every time you progress through it into another era of history from ancient to classical classical to medieval and so on you can completely change your entire culture as long as you're the first person to claim that culture mm, okay so 
like I have in my campaign, like there was a kind of interesting one where like one ancient civilization became the ancient English, became the medieval English. No, hang on. The classic. Yeah. And then the English have now become a Native American culture. All right. Like. Okay. Um, and you keep all of the prior bonuses. So the notion is, from a gameplay point of view, you're trying to assemble a kind of like game-winning super civilization by cherry-picking the particular bits of different Earth cultures as they're expressed in this game at different times, huh. which feels quite fun, actually. Hmm. Um, you can also choose to transcend your existing culture, which basically like gives you like a multiplier on top of their existing bonuses, which is kind of cool. So, like, I started with Babylonians um, and stuck with Babylonians for a while, going big on science, for example. And um, its other innovation that I really like is your cities, when you place them, start out as outposts, where you basically, like, claim interest in a particular area. And then it costs a big subsequent investment to turn them into cities. Um, and what this means is when you're in the Neolithic era, you can place a bunch of outposts during your initial exploration, that initial part of a Civ game where you send your scouts out into the map. Mm -hmm. And it's only when you progress into the ancient period that you pick which of the outposts you placed is your capital city, which feels like it's such a subtle change, but it makes such a big difference to like how in control you feel of your initial fortune. Oh, cool. And I really, mm -hmm. really liked that. And the other side of that is um, later on, you can place outposts and make them outposts of a city, which means they kind of feed resources from where they are back to the main city, or you can choose to kind of enfranchise them as their own cities, in which case they have other benefits. So the city building side of it, particularly, um, which is much bigger than I've, I've kind of described, kind of feels really, really robust in the side of the game that, that works really well. Uh, I'm trying to think what else to say about it. Combat is very much taken out of the Endless Legends series. Um oh, right. And it is, is feels quite thin to me. Like, I can't mm. auto-resolve everything. It's like, you can move things around on a tactical map if you want, but I can't imagine a scenario where bigger army doesn't win. Yeah. So, because there aren't actions beyond fight and move. <laughs> so mm. it it is ultimately a fairly mathematical exchange. But yeah, so so far, I, 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 I happily lost an evening to it yesterday, and I, I will probably lose a few more. Um very promising kind of beginning i think sounds great looks absolutely beautiful from what it i've does. seen it. amplitude stuff is like all their uis have been yeah uh, super it's nice. it's it's ux pornography at this point mm. i think honestly like the 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 way they highlight things for you to pay attention to feels real real good Ooh, good voice mm. losing my entire weekend to that <laughs> indeed yeah I can, I can feel the slippery slope right now beneath me as i look at the xbox launch icon on my bar <laughs> shall we answer a question let's do it all right andrew writes dear crates and or crowbars while consuming games journalism content can you imagine doing such a thing hmm, not so um right. no i sometimes come across people saying that they play video games while doing something else as well listening to a podcast watching netflix and so on for me how and why i play games this approach borders on anathema. <laughs> Ever since I was small, gaming has been about escapism, not escaping from anything so much as escaping to a different world. I'm emphasizing this capitalization in this email. I need to make sure it's representative. To a different world, one full of adventure or consequence-free problems to solve. Bringing the real world into this would break the spell for me, even if it were Graham's dulcet tones. But I suspect that I might be in the minority. People who feel this often do. In your experience, is multitasking while gaming commonplace? Why do you think people do it? Is it a curse of the modern era? Does it make game developers weep? Or is it perhaps something that only game journalists do, eternally doomed as they are to play games for both work and play? Anyway, thanks for the pods. A concerned NPC. I, uh, I uh, listen to watch stuff on the side all the time when play games not all the time uh, actually yeah. a lot of the time if a game like doesn't have sufficiently exciting sound i will listen to something else and um, so uh kudos to the ascent for keeping my attention in that respect it's like the, the guns yeah. and the soundtrack and everything was so good the ambience and stuff flying around so immersive and it's such a key part of the experience for me that i had to devote my entire attention to the thing 
but uh if i was for a lot many of the hours i've played diablo for example i've just enjoyed kind of leveling up that character while or listening to podcasts or having uh some sport on a second screen something like that um and this isn't like a a curse of the modern era particularly i don't think uh from what i've read of kind of cyber cafe culture in korea and stuff like a lot of games are there to be played with one hand cigarette and the other hand chatting to your friends that kind of stuff yeah. it's kind of it's, it's a thing to do while hanging out um so i think like games have, have always existed like arcades as well like uh ways right. to be around other people while you know having this challenge that you're also participating in on the side i think it's it's not a good or bad thing it's just a, a different way of people to experience games indeed um and and to add to that I think it depends on the game. I feel like yeah. we can hit this from every possible angle of it's cool if it's good and it's good if it's nice. Um, where it's like, um, you know, I, I do both, right? Like I am someone who massively values emotion in games and feeling absorbed into another world when that's what I want. Very much escaping both from and to, I like to think. Um, um, but I also listen to things while playing something through an MMO or something like that. I think there's a, um, I think it's important to understand that games will have the capacity to be these kind of all consum- consuming immersive things and occup- like pastimes or occupations in that sense, not like a job, but like something to occupy you while you talk to your friends or you do something else or you, you know, um, go about your day in some other way. Like, I think, I think, both exist and to the point in this question which is about like um you know um does this make game developers weep like absolutely not like this is what games are kind of for right like <clears throat> you know they're they are if, if someone is sufficiently engaged to factor it into their kind of rotation of things that make them happy then you've succeeded frankly um the other side to this is from having uh, a lot of people in my life who who sort of struggle with different elements of ADHD, like the ability to kind of mix in games among other kinds of activity can be a huge balm for people. Like, I don't want to speak to that experience too much because it's not something that I have personally. So, but it's just something that I, I see in other people and I've talked to other people about. But like, I think that's a big factor in, in, in this sort of, thing right and in the role that games play in people's lives yeah and I think lots of games are designed intentionally to be the sort of thing um so like my partner and i are watching a television series called manifest mm. which is not worth anyone's full attention oh, yeah. really uh it's uh you know the whole premise is uh what if a plane went through a storm and then they landed and five years had passed and no one knew why and it gets stupider from there doesn't need any sort of attention but uh it's amazing that it's a kind of force multiplier to having two half fun things happening at the same time mm-hmm. so uh the show is better because i don't have to pay attention to the boring stuff uh because i can play some uh into the breach or something on my switch or whatever and uh, while chatting to uh to emma at the same time and like all those things together makes for a really nice stimulating and a bit of entertaining time for yeah. hours on an evening and good job everyone involved in all, <laughs> all the all the source of entertainment there uh yeah. not everything needs to be completely absorbing uh like brutal amazing something like hbo Chernobyl, which just demands to be watched on its own and with nothing else yeah like, it, you know, jokes on you Chernobyl. i was paying pokemon snap the whole time ha take that <laughs> you beautifully beautifully artificial. crafted piece of television incredibly just just absolutely just anxiety incarnate but no I, I was leveling up charmander all along <laughs> jokes on you always morons. um <laughs> uh yeah it's, uh, it's, it's fine i think it's fine <laughs> broadly yeah i think it's fine like yeah i do i do <laughs> yeah. also think it's fine <laughs> it's hard to it's hard to criticize it really i, I know the um the question was joking i think when uh they said that you know it's a, a curse of the modern era, implying that you know we've all got terrible attention spans. I think that's a bit overplayed, actually. I, don't, I think uh, if people uh, before had more had the number of sources of entertainment we have available to us today, I think they'd probably do the same thing. Yeah, or they'd have died. Or they'd have died of yeah, exactly. exactly. You couldn't Consumption. handle it. <laughs> couldn't handle it. I will. Too much. I will. I'm not a very good Street Fighter player, but I'm pretty m- convinced I could beat anyone from the 18th century and prior at Street Fighter. Yeah, 
That's the dream, isn't it? That's the biggest flex I think I've ever tried to engage in this <laughs> podcast. <laughs> Let us <smack> down. <laughs> exactly. Um, <laughs> wow, new Samuel Peep. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, one of my favourite things on Twitter is Samuel Peep's diaries. A little entry mm. every day. He's an incredibly grumpy man. <laughs> He's so but, mean. Funnily enough, the least angry person on Twitter. Ah, he's true. He's fit, he but can, well. That's because he's an extremely dead white man. Yeah, there's, there's, yeah. there's a whole entry one day where something awful was happening in the news and everyone was tweeting about it. And then there's just an excerpt from Samuel Peter's diary where he's just like absolutely slamming his friend's child for putting on a crap play. <laughs> 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 I was like, I'm really glad I followed this account. Thanks, Samuel. And I would trash him at Street Fighter, that's the point. You would absolutely batter him at Street Fighter, no <laughs> doubt. Like her every day. Um, <laughs> Like a main man. <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah. I'd, I'd, I'd run like against peeps. <laughs> exactly. Uh, R- listeners, write in. Who would you main against? Cammy, Cammy peeps? life. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Cammy life, man. Do something else to do yeah, about enough, it. Yeah. I don't know why. I don't know why I assume he's an e Honda main, but that's. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 good. Um, uh, what do we do now? I think we stop. I think we finished this one. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay, cool. Uh, well, if you would like to send us a question for future episodes of the podcast, please do email us at questions and creating crow questions and questions at creatingcrowbar.com. You can also tweet us at creating crowbar, and we can be found on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash creating crowbar, where for videos of this might be done. Um, the Discord channel for creating crowbar is linked on our website at creatingcrowbar.com. Please do join in talk about things and stuff and life and whatever uh and thank you as ever to our patreon supporters who um uh, generously allow us to continue honking as frequently or as infrequently as our myriad schedules allow uh, you can find out more about supporting the podcast at patreon.com forward slash crate and crowbar i think that's it for outro stuff my name is chris thurston and that's who i've been Oh, that's yeah. I've been Tom Senior. Pickle, 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 pickle. Everybody, where's Ben? Pickle, pickle. We will never know. <laughs> where's Ben? Where's he gone? He's got the man pads. Give me back the man pads. I'm ben. gone. <laughs> Benjamin. I like this new version of this, where like in the in the game, I should stress the the delivery of this line is very much like, "Where's Ben? He's got the man pads we need to save Jeremy's life." <laughs> Like, the stakes are high. They've never exactly. Been higher. But whereas I think I liked your interpretation where he's stolen our man pads. Yeah, he's gone with In them. the heat of battle, he's abandoned the field and taken with him the precious man pads. What, are man, what is a man pad? We don't know. Um, and we will never know. Never because, know. Yeah, but anyway. What do we say at this point in the podcast? Uh, 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 thanks for listening, everybody. everybody.